So what we have is a, a Madonna and child, the most common subject of Renaissance painting. Carlo Crivelli holds a special place in the pantheon of Renaissance artists. He sits outside the mainstream of painting's development in Renaissance Italy, yet his creative imagination and his abilities as a painter can rank with those of any of his more famous contemporaries. His Madonna and Child is one of the treasures of the permanent collection at the San Diego Museum of Art and a high-tech project to document the genesis and state of conservation of the work now shows that there is much, much more to the painting than meets the eye. And according to John Marchiari, the museum's curator of Italian and Spanish paintings, the work can help new audiences appreciate Crivelli's eccentric but beautiful style. He doesn't look like other Renaissance artists. He's a stranger. And this image is typical of his work. Uh, you have this very severe sculptural virgin, a slightly strange looking child, frankly, and this interesting give and take between the old if you want to call it medieval or early Renaissance iconic mode of painting, and then the new naturalism that we see develop in the years leading to 1500. Crivelli died five years before the turn of that century, and no images of the artist have survived. Details of his life, in fact, are spotty. Born around 1435 in Venice, Crivelli was an apprentice in the Viverini workshop, but he spent most of his career in a provincial region called the Marche, or the Marches, far from Venice, which he left after spending six months in jail. He first really comes into a written history when in the 1450s he is arrested, tried, fined, and imprisoned for cohabiting with the wife of, Vene of a Venetian sailor who was out at sea. Crivelli left Venice for good in 1459, first moving to Padua, where he studied the works of Francesco Squarcione and Andrea Mantegna, then to a port town on the Adriatic Sea, today called Zadar, now in Croatia, but then part of the Venetian Republic. Ultimately, Crivelli settled in the marches, first in the town of Fermo, later alternating between Fermo and Ascoli Piceno. But he signed his works as Carlo Crivelli from Venice until his death. But we don't know a whole lot about him. Because he worked in an out-of-the-way place that didn't have a tradition of art historical writing, we know much less about him than we do about uh, a comp comp an art of comparable quality in Venice or Florence or Rome. Art historians' interest in Crivelli has increased in recent decades, and science now sheds new light on the artist, thanks in part to the Digital Clinical Chart Project, launched by UC San Diego's Center of Interdisciplinary Science for Art, Architecture, and Archaeology, she's a three, and its director, Maurizio Saracini. You need to use uh, technology, especially multispectral imaging, that can capture uh, the, um, uh, at different depths, uh, uh, the, the visual understanding not only of the genesis but also of uh, problems of decay that otherwise are not uh, being recognized with just uh, naked eyes. Maurizio loves to use this analogy of the painting as a kind of patient, as this uh, object for study. And we've studied objects in more or less systematic ways in museums in the past, but this is the, a real advance in terms of being uh, thorough and systematic and really analyzing the patient, in this case a great painting by Crivelli, in such detail that later scholars are going to be able to go back and see just exactly how healthy this object was at the time and what we've done to it to in increase its life. We are in the, in the prototypal stage of uh, research and development of the proper technology and the proper methodology um, to be used in order to make a, create a clinical chart. The Crivelli is among a handful of Renaissance paintings at the museum for which clinical charts are now in the works. We've learned a great deal about the painting and what's happened to it from the moment it was created or even during its creation. The construction of the clinical chart begins by assembling the sort of information that museums have always assembled for their collections, scholarly literature, archival research, provenance records, and so forth. 
Some of this information is gathered from records and books, and some from the painting itself. A view of the back of the Crivelli panel, for example, reveals old exhibition labels as well as the red wax seal of the collector Oskar Holczynski, who owned the painting early in the 20th century. This information is then juxtaposed with scientific examinations, including very high-resolution imaging, ranging from 3D laser modeling to various types of infrared, ultraviolet, X-ray, and other scanning techniques, each of which provides unique insights into different layers of a painting. Normally, the sequence of uh, multispectral acquisitions um, is such that uh, you use a wavelength that will help you first establish what is on the surface or whatever is related to the surface move on inside uh, in the painting all the way to the support. The Crivelli is first photographed in minute detail with cameras and filters deployed on an automated arm. Dozens of images are then stitched together, and Chisa 3 researchers use the world's highest resolution display system, the hyperspace wall in the California Institute for Telecommunications and Information Technology, to make sense of the enhanced detail. These brilliant new images help the scientists and the curators study the painting, but they can also be used to demonstrate some of its key points to the public. It's a very iconic painting with this gold background and the Virgin framed against this cloth of honor behind her. Yet you have these modern touches, these touches of, of observed reality. For example, in the way that the child puts his hand on the Virgin's shoulder and leans in against her, or the way his thumb grabs her dress. And then from an artistic point of view, uh, some very uh, beautiful naturalistic, almost trompe l'oeil motifs. So the cloth of honor hangs from this rod, it's held onto it with these laces, and there are these fruits that hang from it. You see these everywhere in Crivelli's painting, and they have both a symbolic and a stylistic function, you could say. The symbolism seems to derive from some passages in the Old Testament, specifically in the Psalms, that talk about the fruit of the womb that will be set upon the throne. This, by the Renaissance, was understood to be a, a prefiguring of Christ. And so um, Crivelli and a number of other artists associate the virgin and child with these images of fruit. Um, they also, though, derive from classical sculpture, specifically from sarcophagus reliefs. Crivelli studied in Padua, uh, or was in Padua at the time that Mantegna was there. Mantegna makes the great examination of ancient sculpture and begins putting garlands of this type in his works. The painting is on a wooden panel in gold leaf, tempera, and oil. Infrared light can pass through the paint layers, allowing the study of a charcoal or ink drawing beneath the paint. Marchiari and Saracini expected to find some underdrawing in Crivelli's painting, but the completeness of the drawing was stunning. And almost a, an obsessive underdrawing uh, that he knew would have been completely covered by the painted surface. And then he begins drawing, probably with a dilute ink uh, with a tiny brush. Sketches in the basic composition, and then uses cross-hatching shading through the entire work, every detail. Only then does he begin painting. For all the obsessiveness of the underdrawing, Crivelli departs from it in places. Comparing the visible light image with the infrared, for example, you can see how he first thins, then thickens the curve of the child's calves trying to refine the position. The computer-generated overlays of the multispectral scanning process also allows curators, scientists, and now the public to fade in and out from one layer of the painting to another. Through this process, one can easily see, for example, places where Crivelli departed from the carefully drawn pattern on the cloth behind the Madonna. The gold leaf would then be applied to the painting. Special punch tools were used to create patterns in the gold. Only then would painting begin. Here, too, Crivelli used an elaborate technique, working in multiple layers. We move in then in the, in the range of um, the infrared band. So we operate at uh, one micron, uh, especially in the pseudocolor infrared. Pseudocolor infrared helps with identifying pigments. Since most of the pigments and uh, binding media are transparent in this uh, wavelength uh, range, then uh, it is possible indeed uh, to uh, gather um, information from uh, the infrared light that is sent over the painting, being reflected at different depths. 
Crivelli's painting was made around 1470, a time when Venetian painters were just beginning to use oil paint. Ultraviolet light produces a very bright yellow fluorescence on oil paint, so scans in that spectrum make it easy to detect which parts of Crivelli's painting were done in oil and which in tempera. For as meticulous as Crivelli is with his little strokes of tempera paint, it's as if he was just at this point learning how to use oil paint, the consistency of which and the properties of which are radically different from tempera paint. In fact, Crivelli painted the entire panel in tempera, then used oil in a few key places. For the highlights in the white veil, the veil's lace fringe that has a see-through transparent quality to it, and the trompe l'oeil device, which seems to be both part of and separate from the painting, carrying the seal of Crivelli's hitherto unidentified patron, seeming almost lifelike in three dimensions even to the naked eye. The ultraviolet scans are also an essential tool in documenting what has happened to the painting since Crivelli finished it. The greenish glow over the surface indicates more than one layer of varnish. Then we have seen uh, uh, restorations. Uh, some of them are... Uh, they look dark because they have absorbed the UV light and, um, and that usually is indicative of uh, some recent restorations. We don't mean necessarily uh, an only cleaning or over cleaning, but in this, uh, for the, the case of the Crivelli, I should say repaint. Then we move on to the x-ray. Uh, the x-ray, it's much more penetrating obviously and uh, it's really, it's a projection of the radio opacity of the different materials, including in this case the panel. Previous attempts to fill holes in the wood panel with gesso appear clearly as bright white dots in the x-ray. Also visible, the extent to which woodworms have eaten into or out of the panel. But the study of woodworm holes can also confirm that the painting was not part of a larger work. If you trim a panel, you expose trails, the sides of trails, um, whereas the worms only ever go directly in or out. So as long as the holes are nice, clean, round entry holes, you know that you have the original edge. Today, conservation is done in pigments that can easily be removed, but in the past, much more aggressive means were used in attempts to freshen up old paintings. We also see three or four earlier campaigns of restoration work on the panel, and these probably date from, well, there may be one from the 16th century, uh, and then there are at least two or three more in the 19th and 20th century. Uh, the sort of thing that you can find on virtually any Rena Renaissance painting. Certain pigments uh, were uh, harmed by cleaning solvents, especially the green down in the green and the brown uh, shadows of the child's legs are very much damaged and, and slightly remade. The blue of the Virgin's robe seems to have been completely repainted at some point, although perhaps rather early uh, in its history. We know that there was some event which caused a major cracking of the paint surface. This is probably the moment when the panel warped. It's probably the same moment when it lost its original frame. Which was nailed directly onto the surface of the panel in the now unpainted margin. The frame moldings were usually also covered in gold leaf, but in this case, the researchers found traces of red paint all around the margin of the painting and determined that at least the inner edge of the frame was vermilion red. This is unusual, but just another of the many facets of the painting that the recent research has revealed. Still ahead for the project are a series of diagnostic tests that will hopefully provide answers to some of the questions raised by the multispectral imaging. We still have not yet done pigment analysis or cross-section analysis. There are some places where we are curious about the layers of paints as to which are original and which are retouching. Also ahead for the project, researchers will do point-by-point non-invasive identification of inorganic materials using both X-ray fluorescence and Raman spectroscopy. There is a lot of material there not visible to the naked eye which with Maurizio's tools and the insights of the Cal IT2 scientists, we're able to bring that out and show it to the public in a, I think, very compelling way. It will allow us to call up the infrared image or the x-ray and the visible spectrum and manipulate them to study the painting, but then to store our manipulations, again, as part of the digital clinical chart. 
And ultimately, this will be linked not only to our own database, but to those of other museums that have such a chart. So that, for example, in the case of Crivelli, it would be very interesting to know when exactly he starts to use oil paint. And that work just hasn't been done. Meanwhile, Marchiari and the team from UC San Diego are developing clinical charts for several other key works from the San Diego Museum of Art's collection. Like Crivelli, the artist Cosme Tura is known to have made complete underdrawings for his paintings, so Tura's St. George was an obvious candidate for multispectral imaging. Also included, this Giorgione, the masterpiece of the museum's Renaissance collection. And because Giorgione and Vincenzo Catena shared a studio, the project is developing a chart for Catena's Holy Family with St. Anne. Some works kind of at the margins of Giorgione. Some disputed attributions by Giorgione may turn out to be works by Vincenzo Catena. And I'm hoping the information we gather here, when compared with information from other uh, museums' paintings, will help clarify the work of the two artists. And they'll use a new imaging technology that has not yet been used on paintings. It's called terahertz time domain spectroscopy. It's a new revolutionary technology that will be able to uh, create an image at the depth, at the interface of every single layer of paint, and at that interface also to make a spectroscopy analysis that, and to, in, in order to recognize which pigment and which binding media um, is present. Currently, only the wealthiest museums can afford their own equipment of the sort used by Chisa 3 to develop digital clinical charts. But as Saracini and his colleagues prototype a standard methodology and portable technologies, like the automated XYZ scanner they've already developed at UC San Diego, the cost of the equipment will come down. As any new science, we have to see that this is the prototype. This is the very early stage. But um, I, th I truly believe that if any museum out there will be able to afford it. If we can develop a useful model that can be uh, exported to other institutions, I think you're going to find that a lot of museums will be able to use these techniques to help them in their conservation efforts. I can see how museums um, can finally join together in tackling this very crucial problems related to conservation and also dissemination of a new understanding of these works of art beneficial for the public at large. Saracini and his colleagues at UC San Diego hope their work at the San Diego Museum of Art will lead to a worldwide cyber infrastructure accessible via the internet to allow museums and researchers to upload and share their clinical charts, one day paving the way for new collaborations, new findings, and a more scientific way of monitoring and safeguarding the health and safety of great works of art.